Today we're wrapping up our look at the Belgic Confession, and the topic that we have feels like an appropriate one to end on. We're talking about the vision of heaven and of eternity. After looking in Article 36 at our relationship as Christ followers to this present world and its authorities, Article 37 takes us forward to our future with the Lord. Now, if the topic last time provided some controversy in terms of our practice in the church in America today, this topic is one that has sparked some doctrinal controversy, especially before the, between the Reformed churches and some of the wider evangelical world. And so we want to take some time in this session to try to understand what we hold in common with other Christians and why it matters what we believe specifically on this topic. Maybe the best place to start is what we hold in common with Christians of all times and places. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ will come from heaven, bodily and visibly, with great glory and majesty, to declare himself the judge of the living and the dead. This phrase echoes the words of the Apostles' Creed, that Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. And it also echoes the words of Jesus himself in Scripture, that one day the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. However, it's important to recognize that we don't know when this will happen. Even Jesus says that no one knows the day or the hour. Now, over the course of Christian history, a number of people have claimed to predict, if not the day and the hour, then at least the year of Christ's return or a close timeline of the final events. Now, I'm not saying that this is entirely wrong. There's value in a healthy awareness of the potential that Christ could return at any time. But the Reformed tradition cautions, rightly and biblically, I think, against putting too much weight on charts or graphs that claim to identify exactly where we are in the so-called signs of the times. Rather, the Belgic Confession focuses our attention not on speculation about which events may fulfill specific prophecies in Daniel or Ezekiel or Revelation, but on faithful and committed service to the Lord, regardless of what events take place around us. In general, it can be said that Reformed theology embraces a vision of the end times which is called amillennialism which holds that the end times prophecies of the Bible are largely symbolic. Now, saying that they're symbolic, I want to be clear, doesn't mean that these prophecies are not real. It means, however, that the seals, trumpets, and bowls of Revelation, for example, or the other specific prophecies do not correspond necessarily to one specific set of world events, but rather portray the kinds of tribulations that God's people will face, maybe multiple times over, before the end of time. Now, this is different than other frameworks of Christian understandings of the end seen in this graphic from Wikipedia, for example, in which the thousand years of Revelation 20, the millennium, are a literal time frame either leading up to or immediately following the return of Jesus, which is in the millennium being kind of golden age of earthly history before the final coming of God's kingdom. Now, the differences in the various forms of Christian belief about the end times is too big a subject to take up here. But I want to emphasize that the Reformed Church understands the Bible to teach a single return of Christ at the very end of history when, as the Belgic Confession puts it, the number of elect is complete. This is in keeping with the Reformed view of a single plan of salvation in world history, a single dispensation, not different dispensations or plans for the church and for Israel, but rather one single covenant in which God fulfills all the promises of history in Jesus Christ. And so there's a single return in which Jesus is recognized as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In words quoted almost verbatim from Acts 1, the Confession tells us, Our Lord Jesus Christ will come from heaven bodily and visibly as he ascended, reminding us that Jesus' return is not something that we will miss, but something that all people will see. Jesus' return is a time when he will burn this old world in fire and flame in order to cleanse it. Now, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but the line is referencing 2 Peter 3, verse 7, which recalls the purifying judgment of the flood in Noah's day and suggests that similarly, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But far more important than the timing of Christ's return is the reality of what will follow. Then all human creatures will appear in person before the great judge, men, women, and children, who have lived from the beginning until the end of the world. For all those who died before that time will be raised from the earth, their spirits being joined and united with their own bodies in which they lived. Then the books, that is, the consciences, will be opened. The dead will be judged according to the things they did in the world, whether good or bad. Now, this is referring to the very end of history, the resurrection of the body. We don't fully understand what happens in between our death and the final resurrection. It's clear that our bodies are in the grave, at least for a time, and we never experience otherwise a separation of our souls from our bodies in life. But it does appear from Scripture that we are immediately conscious of our eternal fate. Think about the words to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. We're conscious of our eternal fate even as we await the resurrection of our bodies on the last day. 
But the important point to grasp, again, is that we will face judgment for all that we have done here in this life, whether good or bad, as imagined in this scene from the Sistine Chapel. As the Confession recognizes, the thought of this judgment is horrible and dreadful to wicked and evil people. Or at least it should be, although I think it's far too easy to just kind of blow by that in our minds and never give it a second thought. But it's also important to recognize that it should be sobering to think about judgment for any of us, because, as we've already confessed back in Article 21, There is a horrible punishment required by our sins. Our sins, yours and mine as well. So what will be affirmed at the last judgment is not that any of us are really good people, but that the total redemption is accomplished for the elect in Christ. In other words, for those whom God and his grace has chosen to redeem through the work of Jesus Christ. The confession reminds us that hell is also a reality. It quotes Jesus' own words about the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Remembering that Jesus himself spoke of hell, we today should also not shy away from confessing the truth of God's judgment, as unpleasant as it is, to remind ourselves and all those around us of the need to repent and turn to Christ for salvation and eternal hope. What we see, then, is that the doctrine of the last things is intended by God's Spirit to help us celebrate the goodness of Jesus and the mercy we receive in him. And that's where the confession ends, with a picture of the glory and honor which is ours as a gift of God's grace when the Son of God professes our names before the Father and all the angels. Every tear is wiped away, and what is right once more will be recognized as such. The faithful and elect will be crowned with glory and honor, and their cause, at present condemned as heretical and evil by many judges and civil officers, will be acknowledged as the cause of the Son of God. And as a gracious reward, the Lord will make them possess a glory such as the human heart could never imagine. The Belgic Confession recalls that throughout history, the cause of God's people has often been dismissed and disdained by the world. But one day, we believe, God will say to his faithful people, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. As the Confession concludes, So we look forward to that great day with longing in order to enjoy fully the promises of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. These promises, we believe, are worth all of our life and energy. As the dedication letter of the Confession puts it, We offer our backs to be beaten, our mouths to be gagged, and our whole body to be burnt, rather than deny the truth of what we confess. Our prayer is that just as we remember together what we believe as Christians, we would find this to be not just a mental exercise, but one which encourages us and deepens us as followers of Jesus Christ in our day-to-day walk with him, as those who know the reason for our hope, and who can then say with longing, Yes, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all his people.